the ethnographic course is intended to be a practical, hands-on, experiential kind of learning learning activity. And um, I would just like to review some of the strategy that's involved and uh, project a little bit ahead as to where else we're going to go. The ten sessions can be thought of as actually five pairs of two. The first and the second sessions are orientational, dealing with vocabulary, dealing with the strategy of, of ethnography itself, and something about the basic principles of data gathering. The field trip that we experienced on Saturday was uh, the punctuation between the first and the second sets of experiences. So we did the orientational things, and then we went out in the field and walked through some observational experience and talked through some of the kinds of analysis that one does of, a, of an ethnographic experience. Now we're into the third and the fourth units. The third and the fourth units are concerned, as your course outline indicates, with skills, particularly the skills of interviewing and the skills of building field notes and coding those field notes. And uh, we're well into that experience now with the uh, Monday session over. And the skill drills are concerned with uh, uh, interviewing. I wish we could do more with uh, experiences in observation, but we'll have to just depend on the field trip experiences to ground that. And then we're trying to look at the question of how do you analyze field notes and how do you code. Uh, we will tomorrow, in the Tuesday experience, we will be going into the coding business, which is a matter of trying to put labels. Uh, the technical word is codes, but the practical word is labels. We put labels on the fragments or the holes of ideas. In other words, we're looking for bits of information. We're looking for what has been said as idea, but also noting the kinds of things emphasized within that experience of the interview or of the observation. What are the bits that make it up? What is the whole of the experience? What are the various kinds of statements that are coming out? One of the purposes, of course, in uh, doing these sorts of uh, handlings of data on paper is that the uh, purpose of science is to provide us a more disciplined basis for inquiry than we could get by simply encountering and reacting and experiencing and saying whatever we think things mean. The whole idea of getting field notes, for example, is a matter of, of trying to increase the level of precision and rigor. Make no mistake about it, this is not a question of perfection. One never does perfect field notes. One never has whole truth. One always has approximations of truth. And as we gain experience and as we gain skills, we move closer to a kind of valid and reliable representation of truth, but still it is approximate. In fact, I would argue that all human inquiry is limited by the fact that human beings are fallible, and in fact human beings are profoundly biased and profoundly limited. And all we can do is just try to make the very best of that. Now when we come to the fifth and the sixth sessions, the, uh, the, the third pair of sessions, we're dealing with the organization of data and the findings from research on the Wednesday or on the fifth day. And on the sixth day, we're doing a, a workshop experience that takes some of this and puts it together and starts to build statements from our field work that can be seen as the, the rough stuff of building a report from the field work that is an ethnographic statement. Of, uh, of the realities that we've encountered. The uh, seventh and eighth sessions are concerned with the uh, somewhat related, well, clearly related, but somewhat peripheral matters of uh, how we use ethnographic research methods in the inquiries into matters of missions and into the matters of, of uh, education. And then in the uh, second of those two parts, we look for, again, some understandings of, of the way ethnography relates to the larger work of research. One of the things to bear in mind is that research is a, an attempt to produce a more rigorous examination of reality and to make a better uh, basis for representing that reality in words.
And when we are looking at uh, the study of social behavior, we generally go down one of two roads. We either go down a highly quantitative road, and we measure lots of things, or we go down a more descriptive road, and we attempt to describe with precision and care what we see going on and what it may mean. Now, ethnography is concerned with just one part of that. But our task is to understand how that one part relates to the whole of science and the whole of scientific inquiry. I would not want, to, for example, to foster the idea that is sometimes uh, pushed that uh, ethnography is in some kind of conflict with quantitative research. No way. Uh, quantitative research has its limitations, but it has its very important values. Quantitative work research is the only way, really, we can handle carefully measured matters in an experimental study. And quantitative methods are very important in the general phenomenon of increased uh, scope in the uh, descriptive research area. So as we do descriptive research, either we're doing small-scale descriptions with a great deal of closeness and intimacy, which are generally the ethnographic researches, or we're doing the larger sweep sorts of studies that are the, uh, the, the survey studies. Ideally, a research study is done in such a way that a, uh, a start is made in every inquiry from a more intimate, precise, listening kind of a posture that we can do in ethnography, and then that study moves on into the matters of generalization, and the question of whether or not these findings from the small-scale work really hold up in the large arena, and we can test that out quantitatively through surveys and other kinds of techniques in the quantitative realm. So this is not a conflict of modes. This is a question of the articulation of modes. So the question we raise in this, what is it, the fourth segment? Yeah, fourth, fourth pair, uh, is how does this all fit together? How do you use ethnographic work in relation to certain kinds of problems? That's the seventh session. And how do you do the uh, designing and planning of studies? How do you do the inquiry associated with taking the materials of outcome from the ethnographic work and check it out on a larger basis and determine through quantitative methods, through surveys and instrumentations of that sort, whether or not these things that have emerged in the small, tight, careful work that we do through interviewing and or observation really holds up in the larger arena of a situation. Within that uh, eighth session, we will also take some time to look specifically at the Likert response instrument. The Likert response instruments are, by all means, one of the ways that beginners to research learn something about instrument design because through a Likert instrument, we can uh, very quickly and with a high degree of, of reliability uh, inquire into people about their opinions and the convictions they have about certain things. And much of what we do in quantitative research or qualitative research is concerned with people's opinions, convictions, and ideas. We can test that out in terms of their agreement or non-agreement to deliberately focus statements. These statements are the rudiment of Likert instrumentation. A Likert instrument simply asks, what is your level of agreement with the statement following? And then one makes an extreme statement, either extreme positive or extreme negative, and the respondent indicates whether or not there is strong agreement with that statement or strong disagreement or somewhere in between. I usually recommend that when people design and lay out on a piece of paper a Likert instruments, since most people in the Western world have experienced one or more Likerts, that they don't even need to bother to label the five positions to be chosen, except to label the extreme. Strongly agree, strongly disagree. You don't even need to put names on the other three points. People generally know what that means. And in any case, you tell them once in an, ori an orientation session for that instrument, they'll have no trouble with it. So you have five options, typically. Some Likerts use four, some six but by general experience, consensus, and some pretty strong evidence in research, the five is the most adequate, so we generally teach use the five and label the one extreme positive, agree, the other negative, disagree, and then treat the scoring system one, two, three, four, five according to where the person's responses are 
in that scale between agree and disagree. Now, why do we get into that at all in a course on ethnography? And the answer is that in this particular segment uh, of the course, we're really concerned about how you relate the ethnographic research to the doing of research in other modes, particularly quantitative studies and surveys that will allow us to check ge generalizability. So we're, we're saying that you've got to know how to build that kind of an instrument, and many items, many kinds of things can be inquired into using Likert. A Likert statement is a simple, direct, straightforward statement, ideally brief, very definitely needs to be singular, so that a person is not responding to two different things that are mixed together, but simply one thing. I like strawberries on my ice cream. Now that's not dual, interestingly enough, because strawberries on ice cream are the thing being focused there. You make such a statement in a positive form if you don't want to have confused respondents. Ordinarily, if you go back from the positive to the negative items, you will find that what happens is that people get confused about how the item is actually reading. People in general responding to instruments don't read very well and don't pay much attention to what they read. They just get in a habit of marking and they'll go right down the page marking things, never mind what the actual words are. So you've got to set up a pattern that you're willing to follow and that the respondent can follow without becoming confused. Now, I think one of the things we might want to do at this time is to take a hard look at how we look, how we do session five and session six the fifth day and the sixth day. The fifth day is concerned with organizing data and findings. And on this day, we have the first experience when we really absolutely must have field notes that are from the work of the student dyad, the two students working together, ready to deal with on paper in a workshop type situation. We need to understand that there are several steps involved in organizing the data and building the findings. Data are the things we saw. Findings are the statements we make about the things we saw in terms of what these sorts of things indicate or, if you please, what they likely can be interpreted to mean. Now, I suggest three steps and they're on the worksheets here. The first step being to work together with your partner to identify the sorts of things that are informational bits and meaningful findings. Professionals quite often don't do what I'm suggesting following, but if you check with, with the professionals, you discover that they learned it this way too. First thing you do is to take your field notes and circle things. You circle anything there that looks like it might be an important piece that you don't want to lose. Now, first of all, remember that the field notes are notes that you have made in terms of your sense of importance and your careful recollection of what was said in the interview or what was seen in the observation. First thing to do then is with your partner, mark by circling on your sheets and his sheets or whoever sheets you're dealing with, all the possible things that could be focused. I usually recommend that you do all that circling before you get into the labeling. And it's perfectly reasonable for you to start thinking in terms of trying to get some expression in your, in your, uh, in your dealings here. Uh, one of the things you can do is make a larger or a heavier circle around something. So a smaller circle or a tighter circle or a lighter circle about others, depending on urgency or importance or the classification of information that it is. There's plenty of space in here for you to think for yourself. You don't really follow a recipe book to do good data analysis of this sort. Second step is after you've got all the sorts of things that you might have in your field notes circled, and I usually recommend you do two or three pages at a time. Uh, don't, don't go beyond that, and, and don't stop halfway through one page and then go back and start working labeling. Do the, do the circling, then come back in the second step, and for each of the circled items, we might call these bits of information, decide what kind of information it is. In other words, what family of thoughts does that particular information or description or statement uh, what is that? What family does that represent? Is this a, uh, uh, a descriptive piece about the environment? Is this a uh, statement about the person's feelings? So is it an environment piece? Is it a feelings piece? Is it a, uh, uh, an experiential piece that you picked up from this person? What kind of information it is? And then you ask, what family does that belong to? 
And uh, you may say, well, it's the family that has that particular name on it. Well, fine. If it's descriptions of that sort, you put down family, or you put down relationships, or you put down whatever is the family that that bit of information relates to. And that's the point at which I think is useful to think of tagging or labeling or putting on a string tag. And right above the circles, connect the two of the circles or right above them in such a way that it's clear what circle this particular word or phrase relates to, you start writing what that family is. Now I suggest you use the family names for the information in fairly clear uh, spelled out words. Now family might become F-A-M, but um, it, it surely wouldn't become simply F. Uh, it's got to be explicit enough that it's clear as you look at this that you have families of information there. In the third step, what you do is to look back at the families that you've named and ask yourself what other kinds of subtleties and subdivisions and sectors are here and what could I use in addition to the family names to make it clear that this little circle here represents this particular part or this particular emphasis within that family in the, uh, in the uh, sense of an informational family. So your third step is really a kind of projecting and amplifying on what you have. You've gone through a fairly mechanical step. You've circled a bunch of stuff. You've put basic family labels on things. Now you need to look more creatively and say, what else could I call that? How should I really subdivide my data in such a way that it's clear what, what is there? Remember these guidelines about coding. The purpose of coding is to cluster bits of information and thus to discover variety, range of emphasis, commonness or uncommonness, and all sorts of patterns of association of ideas and experiences. And the point here is that there is a purpose to the coding that is not simply the mechanical step, but it allows a mechanical step to occur. And that mechanical step is the process of scanning and reflecting upon where emphasis is, where uh, exceptionality is, what is the variety of, of response, and what is the emphasis. So you use words in writing these sorts of things up, like predominant thought or general response and exceptional response. It's not enough to simply count things and divide by the total number of possibilities and try to create percentages and a lot of other things like that. Don't bother to think quantitatively. I've suggested before that one of the things you can do is to use a number, number one, or number two, to say only one other person said something different, or there were only two responses in contrast with this general pattern. Use one and two as your only numbers. From there on, you don't need the numbers. Just talk in terms of predominance, or the general pattern, or most responses, or something else in the verbal realm, not in the quantitative realm. Second guideline, every study will use a consistent coding throughout, but it will always be a coding system that has arisen from the specific data in the particular study. Here's the point. You want the coding to arise out of the data that you have in front of you. It is not a system that is made somewhere else and published so that we all can use the same codes. That might be interesting to do, but it would be useless because the codes are simply an indigenous set of marks, an indigenous set that is a, has arisen out of that particular experiential context. Now generally, when we're doing a study, we have more than one observation, we have more than one set of field notes, we have more than one interview, we have many, and all of those in that particular study would use the same coding system. That will allow us then to compare across papers, across field notes, to say this experience had these characteristics. This experience had another set of characteristics. This one has a dominant pattern of these sorts of factors. This one has a dominant pattern of this sort of factor. And you've got to use comparable elements of description, comparable tag systems, in order to be able to make those kinds of comparisons. Remember that the purpose of the coding is to give you the tool that will allow you to make statements about what the data are showing. Third guideline. Make your codes brief. You'll make them up. There's no standard here. Make them as brief as possible and try really hard to make them as meaningful as possible. 
if you gave everything a statistical code, for example, 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4, and you satisfied yourself that you'd really done that carefully, you'd have, end up with something that you absolutely couldn't use because it is not clear enough as you're scanning data what those particular numbers refer to. Same thing will be true if you use letters or any other kinds of symbols. Try really hard to make the symbol somewhat expressive of the idea so that you can kind of remember. Now, you do need a code book. So in the process of doing this study for this course, start right about now to build a code book. So every time you add a code, you add it into your code book. You've got to organize the code book in some kind of systematic manner so that you can use it as a kind of a directory to remind yourself what code you were using for a certain kind of thing. Generally, people start out by just simply putting two columns. The phenomenon that we're looking at is this. The code for it is that. So we say, OK, well, this is color of hair. Well, that's going to be this series of, of letters. Uh, it's going to be little r and a little b for, for blonde, or it's going to be uh, a, a, some kind of a way that you can see that that's related to the color of the hair. Now, if you, know, if you can have such a study where color of the hair is really all that important, I doubt it. Uh, the next guideline is don't create codes for things you don't have in the data. A lot of people can get carried away with coding and presume that the finest code is one that is done before you really use it, so that you have it all set, ready to use. Um, that, that's a good idea if you're building mousetraps. Uh, you've got to build the, you know, all the way around and the back end too before you start using it. But uh, you're not building a mousetrap. You're simply labeling things, and the labels have to grow out of the experience that is there being reported. And therefore, what you need to do is to create codes for things you have in the data. And don't get outside that. Uh, it, you don't need a, a, a counter code for something. If, if the only thing you have is marks of enthusiasm. Uh, ENTH is good enough. And uh, well, what about the non-enthusiastic cases or the non-enthusiastic moment? Did you have any? If you did, fine. You need a code for it. And what I would usually use in a negative is an ENTH with a negative after it. In other words, using the same code, but in a valence that says positive or negative. I only have to then add one symbol, and it simplifies my codes because I have the same root word or the root phrase, syllable, used for both. Much easier to remember. And then the last one that's on the worksheet here is don't put every single bit into its own unique code category. That will absolutely defeat the purpose. You don't want as many codes as you have pieces of information. If you did, you'd have unique mark on everything. And that means you'd have no way of finding patterns, because there is no, uh, no similarity. Please remember that what you're ultimately going to do with this is look it over for patterns. Look it over for similarities. Look it over for recurrence of the same ideas. Therefore, the codes have to be real. Now, that will, that will keep us busy um, on the sixth day. There's no on the fifth day, there's no question about that. The sixth day is a, a workshop experience. It's a little harder to uh, imagine exactly how it's going to work, because it'll work out of your experiences and out of your field work. How well a diet is progressing will become important here. And again, participants must bring to this session marked encoded field notes. We could say that about all the sessions, right down to session eight. Step one, test your findings for adequacy of detail and thoroughness. Use only your field notes to provide the basis for statements of findings. In other words, don't write into your statements of findings. And you're beginning now in, se in session six, you're beginning to build paragraphs and statements, and you're beginning to get the raw material of your report down, and uh, discipline yourself not to say things, not to write things, that aren't clearly supportable from your data. I've already suggested that it's OK to cheat at this point if you're a beginner. And that is, if you go through your field notes and say, I know we saw that, I know we talked about it, I know it was there, and I remember exactly what was said, but somehow we didn't put it in our field notes. That's a beginner's problem. In fact, that's a pro problem, too. We all have that trouble of remembering things later that we should have gotten into the field notes. Go ahead and put it in. 
generally that's not encouraged and we don't like to suggest that what you do is make the field notes reflect that kind of recollection. Make them precise to start with and then they can become a more disciplinary sort of a tool for you. But in the case of this project, you can go ahead and add something to your field notes about that point in order to uh, not limit yourself to the things you happen to think of when you did your field notes. The, uh, the, the important thing in step one is, is to let your coding system work for you. Let your coding system, which has already been done now on some of this material and in your own homework and in your own workshopping, you would have done it on the rest of your material. You've got this thing coded. And what you're doing is looking through there and letting the codes talk to you. Where are the same sorts of information? Are they recurring? To what extent are they recurring? How do they recur? What combinations of things occur? What does that tell us about how people are seeing, how people are communicating? So let your coding system work for you. You don't go around it. and You don't add to it. You just let it work for you. Step two, put your findings, that is your statements now, from step one together into paragraphs and add whatever is necessary to explain and make an easier to read wholeness in your statements. Now the point I'm making here is not the same kind of cheating we were talking about in terms of adding data. But here we're talking about adding the niceness of language and the clarity of description so that you're not just taking the raw pieces and the statements about those raw pieces, but you're building it into a bigger picture. You're building into a description of what all was going on, what all was there to see. And that's, that's really what uh, step two is all about, is, is building what I call whole paragraphs of idea. Then with step three, try to start your actual writing of database proportions of your fieldwork report using as many of these actual supportable statements as you possibly can. In other words, the discipline of ethnography says that what you should try to do is hold your reportage to the things that you can support in your data. And the way you do that is to let your data talk to you and then describe, then smooth out, and then actually start writing some of that paragraph and sentence stuff into the report that you want to make. And then's the time to start thinking about what the outline of that paper ought to look like and where those pieces ought to be moved around. One thing you don't want is a final report that is so mechanical and so obviously built around a, a rather uh, simplified skeleton that the whole thing just reeks of uh, a mechanical sort of writing. You, you must think in terms of good, elegant, clean writing. One of the things that I uh, allow in uh, writing of an ethnographic sort that I discourage even in ethnographic dissertations, but the convention in the field has it to this point, that first person is allowable in fieldwork ethnography. So if you are wanting to use I and we and my and our and the first person pronouns, feel free. Generally speaking, I find that people in uh, theological schools are profoundly overusing that form in their writing. Uh, and I find that much theological literature is written with more words about I, me, and our than about God. But um, nevertheless, I think it's, a, it's kind of a disciplinary habit within theology that transfers over into ethnography done by uh, theology students. So don't go, don't go too far with it. But if you feel like using the first person to, to make things easier to describe, you may do this in this kind of ethnographic exercise. Now the, the, um, the seventh and eighth material, seventh and eighth day material, we'll talk about uh, after a moment. But uh, right now, that will do it for this course up through the third of the five two-day modules of experience. Day seven and day eight constitute the fourth of the five modules of this particular seminar. Day seven is concerned with the use of ethnographic procedures within research on missions and education. The task is to learn to think of missions and education, and in terms of particularly the decision-making questions within those fields, in terms of 
the matters that could be edified, made more uh, fully understandable, if we had ethnographic data, if we had an ethnographic study to undergird our thinking. What can ethnographic research do to enlighten and deepen the understanding of matters of concern in missions, and likewise in education? Some of us are more biased, more preoccupied about the admissions matters, others more preoccupied about the education matters. The techniques are the same, the, uh, the, the task is the same. What we need to do is to get practical and get functional about the sorts of things that we want to do in the field that you're planning to use ethnography for. For this session, I'm suggesting that we use a brainstorming approach. After this task is understood and presented and understood, perhaps 15 minutes, then you can go into small groups of four. This would be two dyads, and I'd suggest again you try to use the two dyad plus two dyad, um, uh, dyad plus dyad, and then at various times switch that so you're not have meeting, meeting the same people. Two of the people will be constant in any case, but uh, the others would be varied from time to time. But stick with this for about 15 minutes in groups of four for small group interactions. And then while you're doing that, um, call attention to some of the examples that have been created by one or another of the small groups. Do that as a group of the whole, a plenary session, if you please. Then let the work, groups go back to work for another 15 minutes. Uh, what I don't want to encourage is a long time spent in reporting every little jot and tittle that's been worked on by each of the groups, one after another. Just get some examples out, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of those examples, and then move on with another of the cycles here. Close this off, ultimately, with the sharing of two mission and two education examples that you can look at in some detail. Whether you get those voluntarily or you, uh, your supervisor, coordinator, has been drifting around and spotted a few that uh, that person believes would be good examples, take a look at two mission and two education examples of ethnographic problems or tasks within missions and education respectively that could be made more understandable and could be dealt with better if we had an ethnographic research base to work from. The guidelines I'm suggesting here are three. Identify several important decisions and choices relating either to the organizational or ministry tactics and procedures in a specific task or function. Guideline one, be specific. Come down to decisions and choices that must be made within that field or within that task and get specific about what sorts of things would be needed. And then use, second guideline is use this model for such questions as what should we know more about? Or put it this way, what should we understand more clearly before we make this decision? Maybe it's a decision to move into a new field. Maybe it's a decision to change uh, the proportion of missionaries in a, in a station or in a field that are working in institutional work over against non-institutional work. Maybe it's a matter of how urgent it is to push language development in, uh, uh, in the case of new missionaries. All sorts of questions that imply decisions that you could identify and use that model. What should we know more about before we make this decision? Which is a little different from saying, what should we know more about of that decision in order to make it right? Generally, I find that people really can't deal with that question. You know, all you get is a bunch of preconceptions and prejudices. You just have to back off enough to say, what else do we need to know? And that's where ethnography comes in. And then the third guideline, Ask yourselves, how could an ethnographic study provide this information? And try to be as concrete and practical as you possibly can. Now, it is not likely that they, a lot of the day will be used for that particular exercise. And I'm assuming that the remaining part of day seven would be given over to work by dyads to continue their workshop activity from the day before and continue to expand their field, coded field notes and the building of report. The eighth day is a day for an excursion out just a little bit to look at these matters of generalizability of findings, how do we determine that, and the matter of what kind of instruments can we use. The task in the first task, in the first function there, is first to relate the doing of ethnographic research to the larger realm of research, especially to surveys and experimentation. You've got to understand and have experience in doing that which will relate your ethnography to 
the larger kinds of studies. Now, larger kinds of studies does not mean more important studies. But generally speaking, we dare not move too far from a limited sample study. There are certain insights that can be had only that way. But generally, it's not a good idea to leave things at that level if we're looking at the larger phenomenology of a field. Many times in dissertations, we'll only do that first step. We'll only do the ethnographic step. Because then we can put that piece, that ethnographic piece, well done, in the literature, and someone else can pick it up and take that on into survey or on into some kind of uh, larger examination of the generalizability. Or sometimes the original author can pursue that as a next activity. Generally, we don't encourage doing that in dissertations because it just becomes an overburdening, overwhelming kind of task. The second uh, procedure is the, the matter of understanding the Likert response instrument. We've already talked about that in an earlier session here. But Likert is the name of the inventor. Uh, Likert uh, is the person that is honored by his name appearing as the descriptor for this particular instrument. It is that any instrument that uses multiple choice about commitment to a position or belief in a statement or confidence in some kind of a, uh, a position as its basis of data. And the, the, the good Likert items need to be short, strongly worded, and assertive, and singular, and free of odious presuppositions. I'll give you some examples here on this sheet. A Likert instrument can look just as simple as we've shown you in the example here. Notice again. We've just labeled the left side and the right side. We haven't bothered to indicate what a 2 means, what a 3 means, what a 4 means. You'd be surprised that even children in today's societies don't even have to be told what the 2, 3, and 4 means. They just seem somehow to be conscious of the fact that if you have 1 uh, is at one end and 5 at the next end, 4 sits next to 5, 2 sits next to 1, and 3 sits next to the, at the middle. Wonderful. That's exactly what it means. 4 is next to 5, 2 is next to 1, and 3 is in the middle. You really don't need labels to say the obvious. So what you do need to do is to be very clear about that word agree. Whether you put it on the left or the right, I usually put it on the left, but some people prefer to put it on the right. Stick with it, whatever you do, and make sure that at the top of every column where you use Likert items, that little piece exists. Put that at the top of every column of Likert responses. Then that will give you lots of space out here on the left. A survey can be a good method for getting quantifiable data. Now that's a fairly decent statement. A survey can be a good method for getting quantifiable data. Someone could argue and say, well, that's a dual item, isn't it? A survey can be a good method. A survey can get quantifiable data. Yes, but that's pushing it just a little too hard. A good method for getting quantifiable data is a singular statement. You can agree to that strongly, or you can disagree. That's what you have to stop and test when you're writing quanti uh, Likert items. Is it something you can see a person saying yes or no? And by the way, sometimes, if I'm dealing with an older, more sophisticated group, or especially if I'm dealing with, with researchers, instead of writing strongly agree and strongly disagree at the top of the column, you know what I'll write? Yes, with two exclamation points, and no, with two exclamation points, left and right, that's all you need to do. Labeling will take care of itself. Writing good survey items requires knowing how people say things. That's a singular item. Writing good survey items requires knowing how people say things. Very important. Actually, um, these three statements down here are ones to which, if you took this as uh, a test, uh, I would hope that you would have ones on all three of these. Major findings of an ethnological study can be tested in a survey. Right. Absolutely agree. Now on the next page, we've got some other problems. Consider these sample items are four of them on the next sheet. Grapes are my favorite fruit. Is there a problem there? Ask yourself, is it short? Yes. Is it strongly worded and assertive? Yes. Is it singular? Yes. What's the problem? There isn't one. Try the second. I like to hear Spanish because it is such a pretty language. 
Now, the minute we get into the becauses and this kind of dependencies, we've really got two things going here. One says, I like to hear Spanish. It could be that the person says, I like to hear it because it sounds so weird. I like to hear it because it sounds rough, and I like things that are rough and tumble. Or I like to hear Spanish because it's so fast. No, this one says, I like to hear Spanish because it is such a pretty language. That's really two items. I can like Spanish, and I can claim that it is pretty, but that's two different statements. So I'd have to split that one up into two different like statements. The next one, the best colonial masters were the English. Now that seems to be a singular item, and it probably is. It's short, it's strong, it's assertive, it's singular, but here's the problem. It forced the respondent to overlook a presupposition the presupposition here, that there is such a thing as a good, better, and best colonial master. Now, uh, social history would, would challenge that. Uh, there's probably better, or probably worse and less worse, but there's probably not good and great colonial masters. So don't build into the item something that's going to cause a person to stumble and say, whoa, I'm not going to buy that. That's what we call, as indicated on the previous page, an odious presupposition. It doth smell. Now then, in the fourth one here, sometimes I dislike school. This is a problem that a lot of people will write into their like your items because they're timid. So what they do is create an impossible item because they've softened it to the point where it is no longer assertive. It is not strongly assertive here. And then you have to ask yourself, what would be the difference in a person saying, I strongly agree to that, or I agree to that? Is there any difference between strongly agreeing or agreeing to something that is so foggy as sometimes I, like, I dislike school? How can that be repaired? What would you say? I dislike school. Never mind that some people do. They don't say, I don't agree. That's their business in responding to the item. Now, as an exercise for working on this, we're suggesting that each dyad should identify four to six likely findings now that means conclusions or outcomes from their fieldwork project. By this time in the course, you should have many of those organized and much written about them. Pull them out, four to six that are really worth examining in a pursuit study. By pursuit, we mean a follow-on study uh, of, of a quantitative sort in this case. These statements can be estimates, of course, since your studies aren't altogether done. Uh, but go ahead and stick your neck out set up a set of those sorts of statements. They should be worded in the form of a sentence statement which indicates a relationship or a directional observation. Um, try to put that into your findings in all cases. Um, for example, the older children tend to talk more. The question of talking more is correlated with apparently the age of the children. And so that's, a, that's more like a finding in a descriptive research. Things to go together. That's pattern. Or in this case, uh, The international students appear to be more interested in field trips. Again, one factor is the international versus other. The other factor is people who want to participate or enjoy or are interested in doing field trips versus those who are less interested. That's the kind of statement that we're calling a finding statement of the sort, or a conclusion statement of the sort that would make for some good Likert item. Each of these conclusions from the field work should now be stated in the form of a Likert item. That's exercise task two. And you're doing this for only four to six, not a whole realm of things. For each, also try to create a parallel item or two, each of which would get at the same finding but with a different word. Now suddenly I've doubled the request on it. It's not four to six statements. It's four to six statements, and now it's up to eight to twelve Likert item. Because I'm suggesting that you try to create at least two, maybe even three Likert items for each of these findings. The point here is that we need ultimately to understand triangulation. Triangulation is, uh, well, it's best represented in, in what holds up a stool. Why will a stool stand up on three legs? The answer is that three legs triangulate a stool. You really don't need the fourth leg on the chair, except that it adds to stability, but it doesn't actually hold you better. It just makes it more stable when you're getting on and off. Triangulation, three legs, 
is one of the things that we think about when we're building a Laker diet. We have a, we have a statement which we, which we call a factor. That's what you were organizing. Four to six of these likely finding statements. Those are your factors. Now we're going to look at each of those factors with one, two, or three Likert items that are very similar but are not the same. What happens here is this allows people to test themselves and retest themselves on the same basic idea and see if they keep coming up with the same response. By the way, when you do triangulation, you don't put those three items next to each other. You distribute them through the instrument. But you design them so that they're all together and you can see what they are. So we want to try to create more than one item of a Likert sort for each of our, for each of our uh, conclusions. And again, use the remaining time on this day for continuing the workshop activity of the dyads. And I remind here in the, in the worksheet at the bottom of four, it may be time now for dyads to visit other dyads for some looking over the shoulder in the matters of coding, analyzing, and interpretation. Frankly, uh, I'm hoping you're doing that all the way through. But if you haven't been, this is a time when it's just getting pretty close to too late. Spend some time looking over the shoulder. And at the bottom of the sheet here, a reminder to prepare for tomorrow. We need to seek volunteers for the five reporting slots for tomorrow because on day nine and day 10, we're going to be hearing from five and five, respectively, of the dyads. So we need to get those volunteers in line so that they know that they're on duty first thing the next day. If not enough dyads volunteer, don't waste your time. Just start from the doorway and draft the dyads in a clockwise manner until you get the five you need. And you, you, and you kind of technique. This oral report is not intended as a test. People should not look at it with great foreboding. It is a practice session for the sorts of things that need to be in the written report. It is best to hear from both people in the dyad, but they should plan how to divide the task between themselves. So you should not set up a situation where one person reports for both during your triad, your dyadic report. The report should be open to questions from before after 20 minutes and completed all together at 30 minutes. If you run much longer than that, you may be able to get out before midnight, but it could get awful late, so you don't want to cut things so short that you end up, no matter what, don't end up with an extra diet to get into the final day. So in just a minute, we're going to go through the day 9 and 10, which is the final of the three of the, of the five modules into which these 10 sessions are rolling. We will culminate the course 923 with a how have you done and what have you learned sort of session. And we will give each dyad equal time to run through a review of how they stand in their work so far. Again, understand we are assuming that this is not a final report. That final report will be a written report. It should probably have some kind of a little outline. It would be kind of nice if you made an outline to pass out, um, or put on the board, or not a lot of points, but just four or five or six to show your outline of strategy and communication so that your listeners have something to orient themselves to. Plan to hear the progress reports from three dyads before the break and two dyads after the break. I think logistically that's just about the way it works out. If you put three after the break, the day gets, I think, unbearably long. Uh, these are not to be large and long reports, but if the diet is so brief that lots of time remains, more questions need to be asked. And uh, any diet that thinks it's going to you know, relieve its anxiety by giving a five-minute report should be aware that that means they're going to face 25 minutes of questioning. So um, there's 30 minutes there, and it, it's to be used in either the reporting or in the interacting. Please give a solid enough report that we can interact. I will tell you this, though. The odds on any group finding 20 minutes too long is very, very unlikely. Very, very slim. You will find that 20 minutes goes by too fast. So you must think very carefully about how you're going to organize your report and how you're going to present it. Please try to find some manner 
to take turns with the reporting so that both persons in the dyad are on the floor for similar periods of time. Not necessarily microscopically precisely the same, but at least similar. I suggest that on this session, after opening exercise of prayer and announcements and whatever, uh, you move very quickly into the first presentation. Two people in the dyad should try to organize their presentation around this series of questions. This makes a fairly decent outline, by the way. What did you do? Along with that, how did you do it? Who did you see? Who did you talk to? Second, what were the central concerns that you were trying to deal with? In other words, what were your purposes? What was your focal concern? This is where, as in an interview, you might ask, what are the names of the fingers that were your thematic inquiry points? Then, third, what did you learn? And be as specific as you can, but try to focus on major things that you learned. Don't try to waltz through everything that came up. And fourth, what were some of your expectations that proved to be correct? One of the ways we discipline our expectations and our biases is to be honest about them. Every one of us will have expectations as we go into a fieldwork assignment such as this, and beginners especially. But it's a good thing to admit it and to indicate what our expectations were. So what this question really asks is, were there any expectations that proved to be correct? Uh, I warn you here. Uh, that's one way we know where your biases may have misled you. And uh, that's one reason we're interested in hearing you talk about it, because it'll tell us a little bit about how well you guarded against these presuppositions. And then the last point that you can deal with is what unexpected insights came to you. Through good field work, you should get insights. Now, an insight is an aha that says, I think I see some things I hadn't seen very clearly before. I think I see some relationships. I think I see how X relates to Y in a very new kind of way. And I can see how A, B, and C go together, and it never occurred to me that they went together. These sorts of statements we call insights. What kind of insights came to you? That makes for good reporting. Now, after 20 minutes on the floor, the floor should be open for matters of clarification first, and then matters of concern about interpretation. I would, I would encourage you not to jump quickly with questions that are interpretative and debate the interpretation. Give time for clarification questions first. Did you mean when you said so and so? Did you mean this or did you mean that? Uh, give us an example of what you meant by such and such. Use those questions first and then ask questions that will challenge interpretation. Now it, uh, it is possible for us to assume that if you have that framework in mind, you'll have no trouble understanding the following day because I'm suggesting that day 10 would have exactly the same pattern as day, as day uh, 9. But one thing you won't need in advance, and that is preparation of who's going to be on on day 10. That's pretty clear. It's going to be the people that haven't been on yet. So the reportage in day 10 is the balance of the class. This will give you, I hope, through this experience of 923, an opportunity not only to come to an understanding of purpose, motives, and means of ethnographic research, but to have actually done enough of these things that you will have a, uh, a sense of how it can be done, and you will have a grounding for further experience as you have need to do ethnographic work in your own research and subsequent experiences. Most of you will end up with at least one major component of your dissertation focused in the ethnographic inquiry. So uh, this is pretty important stuff. And I just hope that you can make this course come together and that you'll use the momentum we've established at the front end to pursue increasingly at your own direction and at your own initiatives as individuals and as dyads a sense that will uh, direct and guide the course for you. And that you, will, you will not be dependent on leadership to suggest, to tell you what is going to happen next and how it's going to happen. I've actually gone farther in this set of sheets than I usually do when I'm doing this course uh, fully in person myself. And I've done that at the request of my colleagues who are going to be filling in, and uh, I can appreciate their concern because they haven't been through this thing as many times as I have, and uh, I'm very comfortable just taking it as it comes. But uh, as I attempted to try to provide for them a, a sense of the, uh, the guidance for this, I found that it really wasn't very hard 
to think through what these are, things are and how to say them in print. I hope you will value that and, and will learn from it and will find that this is supportive and uh, in, uh, encouraging to you as you pursue your path in the